It's been one of the most nagging issues in our city over the last year, and in fact, it became so explosive, it brought large numbers of people out onto the streets. Hello, I'm KCPT's Nick Haynes, and I'm talking about affordable housing. Tenants' rights now! Pass our package! Tenants' rights now! Pass our package! While many of us were focused on the holidays, in Kansas City, Missouri, an historic passing of a tenant's bill of rights. The motion passes. Um... <laughs> Removing barriers for people who just want respect. Removing barriers for people who want dignity. Removing barriers for people who want to be heard. Its supporters say it levels the playing field between landlords and renters, and it creates a new office at City Hall to resolve housing disputes and root out problem landlords. This is what democracy looks like! Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! It won't go into effect until June, and City Hall still needs to find cash to make it happen, but what does this really change? Are landlords big losers in the deal? And does this do anything to increase the amount of affordable housing in our city? This hour, we're heading to the Plaza Library for answers to those questions. We're raising the roof on housing with tenants, landlords, our new mayor, and with you. My paycheck won't pay the rent. Many Americans who've discovered the words affordable and housing don't necessarily go together. Tenants rights now! Nothing in this Bill of Rights should scare a landlord who's already doing right by their tenant. This is a business breaker for us. We will not do business under these laws. This ordinance needs to have a lot more thought. What we need to do is a New deal size type of policy answer around housing for poor people. This is a very important issue. Support for this program comes from the Kauffman Foundation, AARP Kansas City, and from the annual financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Two years ago, we were right here in this space talking about evictions at that moment in time, and we had an absolutely packed audience, which was amazing to us. We followed it up with a documentary called Evicted, where we looked at people who were being evicted in Kansas City. And we followed it up with a town hall on affordable housing, and we had a huge crowd that came for that too. But did anything change? Mm -hmm. After all of that talk, did anything happen differently? Did things get worse? This is what this hour uh, is all about. Some things did change. Two years ago, he was just a pimply youth, one of 13 voices on the city council. Today, he is your Kansas City Mayor, Quinton Lucas. <laughs> Two years ago, Tara Ragavir was on the stage being introduced as a Harvard-educated researcher. She was, spent five years lifting up the hood on the scope and scale of evictions in Kansas City. Today, she leads one of the Metro's most potent grassroots movements, Casey Tennants. <laughs> While Tara was lifting the hood on the city's housing problems, Tiana Caldwell, next to Tara, was being evicted from her home after rising medical bills from a cancer diagnosis left her unable to keep up with the rent, and she ended up spending six months with her family in a cheap motel room. Stacy Johnson Cosby is a realtor and a landlord who, to put it bluntly, is fed up with how landlords are being demonized. She leads a coalition of home providers and serves on the Jackson County Board of Equalization, which is coming face to face with citizen anger over eye popping property assessments right now. And Sam Albert is executive director of the Heartland Apartment Association, which thank you so much uh, for being with us. And our sixth panelist is you, and we'll be hearing from you throughout this program as well. Uh, but first, Mayor Lucas, when you ran for office, you talked about everything from uh, tax incentives, there was huge crime, we had potholes all over the city. But on the very first day you serve as mayor, that isn't your priority. The first night as mayor, you go to the east side of Kansas City to spend the night with a family living in a townhome documenting their problems with affordable housing. Why was that so important to you as the major priority on the very first 24 hours in office? I think if you're gonna talk a lot about an issue, you need to make sure you understand it. And although I grew up uh, in some properties that were less than ideal and we moved around a lot, it had been a few years since I really got the experience. And so I thought instead of me just lecturing and saying what I think, we need to do something as public servants, which is to get out there and explore it. 
and to understand what's going on and to see, frankly, some of the conditions that people are forced to live in every day. What did you learn from that experience? You know, what I learned is that, frankly, it's very hard often for tenants to be able to fight. We often hear about there are all these remedies. You can file a suit. You can all do all of that. If you're a regular person who's trying to get by, trying to raise your family, trying to actually take care of just getting through the day, then it's very hard for you to keep going after a landlord, particularly an out-of-town landlord, particularly folks that sometimes are, frankly, abusive to their tenants and others. And that's what I learned about from that experience. Public television audiences two years ago, almost in this very space, we're learning and seeing you for the first time, Tara Ragavia, and, and you had a major statistic at that time, 42 eviction <clears throat> notices going out every single day in Jackson County. Did we do anything better on that? Did we improve in the last two years? Nope. Uh, 9,500 evictions were filed in the last day, pegging us at about the same 42 formal eviction filings per business day. And I think the important thing to note the way that we're getting worse is that the folks filing evictions are continuing to change. So the place where Mayor Lucas spent his first night is a place called Green Village Townhomes, and it's owned by a landlord that does not live in Kansas City, does not live in the state of Missouri, and does not live in the United States of America. They're a big corporate actor that owns 1,800 units in this city, that's a low estimate, and 1,800 in St. Louis. And they are a plague on our city. They're extracting from our economies. And that's the big change in the last two years. There are more of them. You cannot, if you ever watch any media source in Kansas City, and not see Kansas City tenants, the group that you helped found. Well, I think this is actually important to talk about in the context of what happened two years ago. Our conversation here two years ago was a turning point for me because I came into a space that was electrified about this issue that I think a lot of people didn't assume was an issue in a community like Kansas City. The rest of the country thinks that Kansas City is affordable and people here are doing well. But what we heard that night two years ago is that this is an issue that impacts our community. And then I spent two years coming back here talking to folks about my data and people cared, they were aghast, they were angry, but nothing happened until we started organizing, people were actually impacted by this problem. And those folks, many of whom are here tonight, have demanded a seat at the table. And in a matter of months, we've seen more change in the conversation and the potential policy in this town than I think in decades before. The Bill of Rights catalogs the existing federal, state, and local rights that tenants can expect to be protected. The second piece is an ordinance, and that ordinance expands some of the responsibilities of existing city departments to protect additional tenant rights, and it adds a critical enforcement mechanism that says if there are egregious or repeated violations of those tenant rights, the city has the ability to suspend or revoke landlord licenses. Tiana Coldwell, how would that have helped you? It would have changed my life. Um, I was evicted by my landlord because um, I had to choose between uh, my medical expenses, medical expenses and paying my rent. Uh, I chose to live and my landlord evicted me. Um, those expenses happened, right? And even though the Cancer Society was there to back me, was willing to pay all of those outstanding um, expenses that had occurred and would continue to and had my back, the landlord didn't care. I was evicted anyway. They wanted their money right now, and it didn't matter what I was going through. Um, that had been in place um, with this eviction, right? And I have this scarred letter, this scar on my name, and I can't rent a place, a decent place, without the hassle of them, you know, looking at me under a microscope and saying that I don't deserve it. So we have a Bill of Rights for Tenants. What is your concern, Stacey Johnson Cosby? This is yet another layer of bureaucracy on top of what already exists. So, it, and, and it also duplicates many of the protections that are already out there and in place today. And so instead of solving the problem, it just adds another layer of red tape. The Bill of Rights would make it illegal to discriminate against tenants based on rental history. Isn't that illegal now? It's not illegal now. Um, so the rental history component of the Bill of Rights says that we want to end the practice of putting a box on a rental application that asks whether or not you've been evicted. And if you check the box, your application's thrown in the trash. Mandating that the city council create a tenant's advocate's office with authority to investigate suspect property owners and revoke landlord permits. 
Sam, what is your concern about that? Well, to begin with, creating another bureaucracy is, is troublesome to us, where we know there are limited resources, and we support, we absolutely support proper enforcement of the regulations that already exist. And it, it only costs to add layers of regulation. It doesn't provide one new unit of affordable housing. We're talking about creating a new agency, a new department within city government. Some people are asking, though, who's paying for that? You've got all these other problems. We, we have lots of challenges, but here's the thing. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of very kind of general concerns, too much bureaucracy, red tape. It's like we're in the 1980 presidential election or something. I mean, for me, I think the clearer thing we have to say is, is this commonsensical? In some ways, I actually think this is helpful for housing providers, tenants, and everybody to know what the rules are. Exactly. Right now, to find in the code of ordinances all the different regulations is very challenging. The Bill of Rights establishes, according to the original document, a right to counsel, mediation for people who make less than 200% of the federal poverty level, and asks the city manager's office to pay their attorney's fees. Is that still there? Have you ditched that? Is that still part of it? And who pays for it? So first of all, why do we always ask who's going to pay for this or how are we going to pay for it when it's a policy for the people, right? We never ask that question. We never ask that question when it's about another $36 million financial backstop for a parking garage downtown. And the right to counsel and mediation did not make it into our final proposal. We still want it there. We believe that right to counsel is a common sense solution that actually saves cities money. Philadelphia just passed right to counsel last week after a cost benefit analysis showed that it was cheaper for the city to provide counsel for tenants on the front end rather than pay for the cost of homelessness that was increasing on the back end. Sam. Right to counsel? Everyone has a right to counsel. We also have, we also have... You have to have money to pay for it. We, we, pardon me? You have to have money to pay for it. Well, we have legal aid. Legal aid is in place. Legal, okay. legal, aid, legal aid receives a lot of money today. Stacey. What I'd like to say is on, when we talk about evictions, if there are 42 evictions per day, there are two victims in an eviction, the person who's getting kicked out of the house and the person who owns the house, because chances are great that there's a mortgage on that house. Many of the, the, app, the profile of probably the, the typical um, landlord or housing provider, maybe someone that has one or two houses, maybe someone in the family passed away and left the house for them, and so they are a landlord, or someone that may have five, 10, 20, or 30 homes. And so if, if, and if they have, in this investment, a mortgage payment on that property, and then they, they go with the person who is sick, the person who loses a job, and they can't make the payment. The person must then take care of two households. Now, that ain't right. Now, what, what kind of sense would it be to expect a person to be in a situation where you take care of your household and because someone else is bad luck to have to take care of theirs? So my answer about the right to counsel is, like Sam said earlier, we prevent the eviction to begin with. I'd rather not pay money for an eviction on the back side of it because um, according to uh, Ms. Brown, our mayor's attorney, 90% of the eviction cases that she saw when she was um, a judge were because of a lack of, of payment. You, you didn't make the payment, and so therefore you, did, you breached their contract and you're going to be evicted. No matter how good the lawyer is, they can't win that eviction. So I'd rather use the resources with emergency assistance up front if someone is in trouble and can't make that payment, let's get that payment in their pocket so they don't have to worry about being evicted. We'll hear more from tenants, landlords, and the mayor straight ahead. But first, you hear of people being evicted from their homes, but how does that really work? KCBT's digital magazine, Flatland, got an uncomfortable first-hand look. Stephen Summers owns around 50 rental properties across Kansas City. We are off to knock on the door of one of our tenants that we are getting ready to file an eviction on. We try to educate our tenants. If the rent is late, there are late fees that have to be paid. If they're going to be late, to call me, to let me know. Because if I don't hear from them, I don't know what's going on. This tenant in northeast Kansas City owes Stephen around $3,000, which includes three months' rent. Stephen thought they'd agree to a payment schedule, 
but nothing is being paid so far, and he can't reach her by phone. If there's no penalty for not paying, okay. it's just human nature. Why would you yeah. pay? Well, I, I'm the landlord. I, An eviction can cost Stephen. An empty house is a money hole. It will suck the money right out of my bank account fast. We don't want empty houses. Your mom needs to give me a call uh, right away. Stephen cancels the eviction for this tenant after she starts to follow the payment schedule. But on a later date, two miles to the south, following a court order, there's a different outcome. We have to set the personal items out on the street curb as we are uh, changing the locks, and they won't be allowed back on the property. The tenants aren't here. Stephen thinks they're at work and the kids at school. Some of the bigger furniture and some of the electronics are going to stay in the house. The tenant wants them. They can call me at the office. The monthly rent was $500, and they haven't paid the last four months. Stephen's team bag up all the personal items, and it's left on the curb. Some people watching this may think, Steve's a bit heartless, isn't he? I mean, this is someone's home. Uh, I would say we followed the law. They had their chance to come and pay their rent. They refused to. Unfortunately, they're paying the price today. Stephen tries to avoid evictions like this by only renting to certain people. It's been our experience over the last 30 years that if someone is paying more than 25% of their income for their rent, they will not be able to keep that up. The Bill of Rights for Tenants passed by the City Council, what would it do to landlords, Sam, in your estimation? We believe it's a disincentive to reinvestment in the housing stock. In our, in our older neighborhoods. And, and it's not just our belief, it's happening. It's happening today. We have people exiting our market because we're not going to build our way out of an affordable housing crisis with new construction. The, today, the economics just don't work. We have to go back to the existing serviceable housing stock and reinvest in that housing stock. This type of regulation disincentivizes people to bring capital to the area. Someone said something to me many years ago that stuck with me. It says, capital goes where it's invited and stays where it's welcome. This is a very unwelcoming situation, and we're seen as a hostile environment throughout the United States right now for reinvestment. This is the same thing they said about healthy homes, right? Yeah. Same two landlords. <laughs> Stealing the business, right? And it's not about paying the landlords because who wants to pay a landlord who has you living with black mold? Mm. Who wants to pay a landlord where your heat does not work and it's cold outside? Exactly. There is the reasons that you should not have to pay your rent. They still want it. They still go to court and win 99.8% of the time. Well, who wins that much unless the cards are stacked against the other side? Right? And that's real. Nobody wins that much unless the cards are stacked against the other side. Nobody should have to pay a landlord who, who have you living in subhuman, not inhabitable conditions. No one should have to. And a, and a lawyer would help us keep from having to pay those expenses because we would be seen from that side. We'd be represented. Tiana, you mentioned the Healthy Homes Ordinance. Voters went to the polls last year and voted for that. That would require and it hasn't hurt a, them. Fee, a fee to, 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 for landlords for each of their units to allow inspectors to make sure that those um, properties uh, were healthy and uh, the conditions were good. At that time, landlords claimed uh, if that were to be passed, uh, it would, landlords would just sell up. They wouldn't be part of it anymore. Did that happen? It did happen. And the reason I know is because I'm a real estate agent and I had a client call me to sell their listings. Had other agents that are peers that said that not only were they selling their personal holdings, but they had clients that were selling their homes as well. And so I have numerous stories where that happened. And it's interesting that those of us who are in the industry who said it was going to happen, when it started happening, you, you won't believe us. But you'll believe it in maybe three, four, five years down the line when our inventory of affordable housing disappears because people are not willing to make the investment. What kind of investor who has a choice of where they spend their money will want to come into an environment that is punitive with layers and layers of regulation on them? They'll go where their money is welcome. We're more One than a year into the healthy... One wants to rent a truly safe affordable, accessible, and healthy home. That's who we are. Sam. Here, let me, let me just say, it's, Steph, because I, I got to hop in. OK. Because there, there's been a lot of stuff. That, when I was growing up, child of a single mother, she worked all the time. She's catching the bus. She's doing all of that, right? We had all types of things. A window broken during the winter, so it is cold in the house. I slept on the floors and that sort of thing. Yes, she could have gone to the Jackson County Circuit Court, gotten a lawyer, right, filed a suit for a breach of the implied warranty of habitability, but she didn't have the money. She didn't have the time. She didn't know a lawyer. So what did we do? We slept through that winter with it cold in the house 
House with all those types of issues. This is a way that we're trying to create equity. And frankly, giving someone a right to a lawyer doesn't mean that you're actually taking money from the property owner. All it means is they actually have a right to fairness and a venue. Sam. And by the way, let me just say this. This isn't actually in the legislation, but we don't even have to debate it. It's not there. All right. So let's just talk Sound, about what's we there. We want to hear from you. Th thank you. So I don't, I have, to make, I don't have to argue your point. <laughs> right. So who are the buyers of these properties that are going on the market? It, it, they aren't local folks. They're the, they're the out-of-town investor who still sees Kansas City property as a huge bargain compared to what they see on the East Coast or West, West Coast. We have very inexpensive land values in this part of the country. But they don't ever realize, however, is how difficult it is to realize any upside potential from, from those investments. And so what they do is defer the maintenance on those units, so you wind up with a situation that where you have the, the, the uh, tenants lumping all corporate landlords into one, one big uh, mass. That, that just... It's just not so. The vast majority of multifamily housing in the region are real estate investment trusts, large corporate uh, out-of-town owners, and it's, it's like any other commodity. They sign up for a return on investment, and that, that is, that's, that's the business. Well, I was preparing for this program today. I probably got seven to eight calls from different landlords locally whose big complaint was that it's all fine to offer all of these different new rules, rights, and uh, uh, opportunities for tenants. But are you worried, they said, um, that this is only going to actually increase the rent that they're charging tenants? I'm not concerned about it because we've worked with landlords every step of the way to write the proposal. There's a landlord on our strategy team and what she says and what many of the landlords who support us have said is that if you're a good landlord doing right by your tenants, you've got nothing to worry about. Stacey Johnson Cosby, uh, you put out a press release as a leader of the Kansas City Regional Housing Alliance that stated if Kansas City tenants get their way, landlords will be forced to rent their homes to anyone that just shows up with cash. Do you still feel that way? I don't believe I said it exactly like that. But what, the, um, what they want to do is expand the protected classes so beyond race and religion that now the person that you cannot rent to without fear of being sued or having a complaint brought against you is someone that may have, we talked before about their rental history, they may have evictions. And then if I say, no, I'm not going to rent to you because you have an eviction, then I open myself up for liability. If we have a, a neighborhood and we know that the, the house right here, right next to our property, has five children and it's a single mom raising them, the house next door on the other side is a senior, a widow, uh, who has lost her husband and lives alone, and someone comes and wants to rent that is a, um, a sexual offender that's been convicted and has served their time, I have to be careful who I put in that home because if, if we put something in that, someone in that home and something happens to either of those neighbors, they're coming right at me. They're not coming to the city. That's a concern. So how do you address that concern? I'll, I'll, I'll just Lucas? be very honest. And I guess I'm the lawyer of the panel. I, I mean, that, that's just not an accurate description of the ordinance. That's, that's, that's just... No, it's, it's just not what it says. I mean, anyone, go pull it up. It's online right now. And it, and it says, right, in essence, that you can actually still review, right, either criminal history, rental history within it. This has been one of the most, one of the biggest distortions in the entire conversation. And I understand how we get to this, because in American politics, we want to be like, this is a big, evil, red tape bureaucracy thing. And maybe on the other side, we want to say landlords are bad. No, this is actually a good compromise piece of legislation where we've said, look, we want to, yes, codify the rights that exist so people know what's up, and I don't know how that's new red tape at all, and in the other hand say that, no, you can't basically use a box to exclude people, but you can still review it. Nick, it's exactly the same as ban the box in Kansas City, Missouri employment. You can't say if you've been arrested that you just can't have a job and we'll throw you out. What you can say is, I can look through your criminal history and see how it's relevant and germane to what you're doing here. It is not a threatening document that will in any way overthrow landlord rights in Kansas City. Okay, well, I, I, want, I want to get 
we, we're going to get to you, Stacey, in a moment, because I know there's another side to this, and we're going to move into that in a moment. But let me just tell you, we're going to bring the microphone out. We're going to ask you. You can have your own questions. Please be respectful of one another, though. Can we ask a question in less than 30 seconds? I think most of us can do that, can't we? Yes, we can. If you have a question, make sure that the question is something that other people may be interested in, and it's not just your own personal circumstance. Can we do that, ladies and gentlemen? And we'll get to more of them. But we've talked about the, the Bill of Rights the tenants have. Landlords themselves, now calling themselves home providers because they don't like the way they've been demonized, have come up with their own Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. You may not have read all of that. I'm just going to give you a quick taste of some of those, and we'll discuss them. The landlords, now known as home providers, are not going around in their own coloured T-shirts, though you might want to do that after this event. No, thank you. Uh, but one of the things I was... <laughs> when I poured through the document, the city should support the creation of a tenant housing provider university that offers tenant education and financial literacy we training, we basic home safety and maintenance techniques, eviction prevention and home buyer education. Is that something everyone on this panel can support? Absolutely. Yes. It's totally and condescending. You, okay. That's Why should I have to do maintenance on a property I'm renting? That's not the point. That's right? not the point. Why should I have to learn how to do pro pro maintenance on a property that does not belong to me? That is your job. They're passing the buck, right? Um, which is what they are, they're continuing to do. They've been doing. Um, and even to speak to them feeling like things are not fair, they've been winning. Right? How are things not fair on your side? You don't win when you have thousands of dollars due to you because of past tenants who can't pay their, their rent. And so you don't win in that situation. We're not in a position of winning. And what we need to do in this landlord-tenant university, what it does for a tenant, as it says in the maintenance they're talking about, things like, you know, how to, you know, change your furnace filter if that's in your lease, how to change a light bulb. And believe it or not, we've had tenants, my husband is sitting here tonight, we've had tenants call him to come and change a light bulb. And so things like that, it's like, what does it take to be a good, responsible tenant, taking care of your own property and not being at the whim of someone right. else? And something that's really important to me, I want all these yellow shirts, if they want to own homes, I want you to have a piece of the American pie and help build wealth and legacy to pass on to your family. You don't always have to be a tenant if you don't want to be. Let's hear from some of the people in the yellow shirts who happen to be at the microphone. We have others, too. I got my own questions. But let's hear from you, first of all, madam, your question, your pithy, insightful question for our panel. So I think we've heard that a common enemy is the out-of-town corporate landlord. So I'd like to ask you, on the landlord side, what would you do to bring those landlords under control? What ideas do you have? I think the common enemy is the slumlord. The city knows who they are. They don't have the will to enforce the ordinances against them. You and don't have the will we, to enforce we, the ordinances we, already on the books, we want man, them Lucas? Out, we want them out of business. We want them out of our city. Okay. Here, well, here's the thing, right? This is actually what what KC tenants and, and landlords see everybody saying we don't agree. Everybody we agree. agrees. Alaska. The reason there's an office of tenant advocate is so that you actually do have a city enforcement resource. That's but, what this is about. But, but no, I, I don't think it's, Sam is. It's I, doing what you want. Yeah. It's, do, it's actually saying we don't do it well. Let's improve it. What's Sam, wrong with that? You don't agree. The, what is the end game? What's the remedy for the bad landlord? We have we know that there are hundreds, a couple hundred repeat offenders sure. in, this, in this market. They know who they are. Your law department will tell you, what, they won't deny, this isn't a priority. So they don't go after them. At the end of the day, the city may wind up with a derelict property, which you don't want. You don't want to be the landlord. Sure. Nor do you want to be responsible for relocating families out of, out of derelict properties. Uh, and that's just a fact. Everything you all just said is what's being proposed. It's, it's let's create an enforcement opportunity. Let's okay. address the slumlords. I don't know what we're fighting but about. We actually all agree. This is I rare don't think American they do, though. But, 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 but what, I, what, I, what I say is that already exists. Tenants today can call the health department, make a complaint. Right. If the landlord doesn't comply, put them out of business. And if the person is discriminating against you, there's a human relations department with the civil rights division. So if you've been discriminated against, you can make the complaint today. We don't need to wait so until we're, June. We're saying it it's under-resourced, yeah. so let us no, no, create no, an no, no, office that can we're, do no, it. And I'm saying that it exists today. We don't have the will, our health department, our human relations department, or whatever it is, that may not have the will to enforce it. We know who the bad actors are. The laws are in place today that could put them out of business in this city. 
However, they have not been have not done that because they don't have the will to. Like Sam said, if they put someone out of a property, now the property sits empty, and where will that family go? Okay, tell her. I'm encouraged. We have a new mayor. I think he has the will, and I think the current city council has the will. And I will repeat that the big difference between now and two years ago is we have an accountability mechanism on the outside in town that will make sure that the bad actors are, are held accountable. I will tell you right now that we've been running a campaign against TEH Realty for a little bit less than six months. And just last week, the housing authority ended all future contracts with that slumlord company. And the change is happening. And okay, thank you. Let me let me listen to this. I want to listen to you, madam. All Your right. Question. So this is really disappointing because I. I thought I was coming to learn more about what Kansas City is doing about the fact that affordable housing is not available. And you've spent all your time arguing over tenants versus landlords. My question is, we have a lot of vacant property in the city. We're at risk, to someone's point. People want to invest in Kansas City, but most investors want a very large return. How do we make sure that those investors are building affordable housing, not $200,000, $300,000 houses that people can't live in? Thank you very much, madam. And for being so crisp, Stacey, and then the mayor. So I think we need to create an environment where, there, where we create more people like me and landlords or housing providers like me that may own 5, 10, 20 um, properties. And so we need to make sure that we don't have too many regulations in place that will scare us off. Like Sam said earlier, investment goes where it's wanted. So we want an environment that's welcoming to us, which means that the city can do a lot of things with some zoning ordinances, and they can um, incentivize um, us, and they can use also... OK, let me say, that, that is actually in your Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. Right to establish incentives to encourage affordable housing production. Is that not happening now, Mayor Lucas? I chair a housing committee where we actually talk about this stuff all the time, and I encourage you all to care about kind of the three prongs of housing that are important. Quality of housing, which is really what's being debated today and what guarantees exist, but also creation of more units. There are several ways we create more units. Some of that is stimulating the private market, really in single-family homes, getting people to rehab. We're trying to shift more funds into that. You might have heard me talk about a $75 million housing trust fund that we're trying to identify enough funds for to support the creation of more housing. And frankly, I think we need to make sure we do address abandoned houses and the vacancies issue. But here's the thing. Just because we talk about housing quality today doesn't mean we don't care about housing creation. It doesn't mean we don't care about abandoned housing. And I think, frankly, they are all important parts of it. Me saying that I want a tenant to have rights doesn't mean that I'm also not saying I want to see a thousand more single-family homes repaired in East or South Kansas City. I think we can do okay. both. Uh, and that's what I actually heard from people who called me at the station, the KCPT, and said, Tara, oh, this Bill of Rights, great. How does that in any way increase any units of affordable housing in Kansas City? Well, I think you can't have a conversation about supply without also having a conversation about quality and actual safety and dignity within the unit. I don't want an affordable housing unit, as Tiana said, that's filled with black mold, right? So when we do the first step of protecting tenants in the homes that exist currently, that opens up the possibility for us to explore the second step. And if you think, Casey, tenants has fallen asleep after this Bill of Rights, you got another thing coming. Because the next thing, the next thing that we want to work on is increasing supply of units. And I actually have a lot of ideas about this, and I know a okay. lot of my friends can, in the can audience you give us do one? too. Sure. So I think the mayor needs to fully fund this affordable housing trust fund, right? And then that money needs to go to local community builders, community owners, people who are going to control their own property. And that money needs to come with restrictions that are restrictions around what the rents can be, how much they can be increased, and what the quality of those units must be in perpetuity. This affordable housing trust fund, though, has been talked about a yeah. long time, yeah. and they haven't funded it. Where does that money come from well, there, Lucas? You know, it's amazing, because we talk about will of things, and, and this is one area I agree. We've identified roughly $42 million of the funds. Tara before did mention a $36 million parking garage that we're helping construct. I mean, if you're asking where the money goes, that money goes to lots of other economic development priorities we have each day. So because this is all about agreement and coming together, I would hope Casey tenants, housing providers, and everybody says, let's fund more money for housing creation. Let's lobby city council and so many others to make sure that we're doing creation, we're doing rehab, we're supporting providers and tenants to make sure we're creating more housing in Stacey. Kansas City. And so I, I 
agree with that, and I agree with the lady. I'd rather spend our time tonight talking and using all of this time to talk about what we need to do to create affordable housing from the people in particular who create that housing. Let's get us in a room talking about housing. And one thing that I, I'm concerned about, um, Tara mentioned that we want to, she has some plans in the future, and what the plans are happen to be in their National Homes Guarantee, where it's the people's action. The ultimate yeah. goal of that organization is an, an overarching national group. It's not just a local <laughs> grassroots organization. Their goal is to have 12 million public housing units in this country. Right. And, and so to, to that I say, I'm sure you clap, but you may not remember Wayne Minor. You may not remember Cabrini Green projects in, in Chicago. And so my point, my point is that I'd rather incentivize the private market to use our money instead of government money producing government housing. Here's a little history lesson, right? Public housing in this country was first constructed during the New Deal, and it mostly served white working class people. And it was a dignified, amazing place to live and raise a family. And then our government subsidized the mortgages of those same white families to move out to the suburbs and buy homes, therefore concretizing white wealth in this country forevermore, right? At the same time, public housing, public housing then became a place where black and brown poor and working class people lived. And then, not coincidentally, we saw public housing completely disinvested from. And that is to blame for its failure, not its tenants or its construction. More to come from the Plaza Library in just a moment on this hour-long KCPT housing special. But first, did you know Ken Burns has picked public housing for his latest film? Coming up in March, Burns takes you to the birthplace of America's first public housing development and the first city to tear it down, Atlanta, Georgia. Robbery, prostitution, killing. Poverty, the shootings, the drug abuse. Pow, pow, pow. It was just like you was in a, a movie, Western movie. I would never go into East Lake Meadows alone. It was completely dysfunctional community. You hear the gunshots going off all the time. All you can do is grab your kids up. It was just this chaos. It was called Little Vietnam by the police for good reason and was just viewed as irredeemable. It was just, it was a place that was beyond the capacity that anybody could imagine things being different. We're not mature enough as a society, I think, to look in the mirror and see how we manufactured American poverty, how we manufactured housing that was uh, meant to seclude uh, these poor people, uh, and how we turned a blind eye to creating, to creating a middle class while simultaneously excluding people from it. Ken Burns presents East Lake Meadows, a public housing story coming March 24th to KCPT. Meanwhile, Thursday, we crack open our local history books to tackle Kansas City's troubled past with race and real estate. That was the main mindset of that day, that races did not intertwine. It, it was codified, it was written into the deed of this homeowners association. If I lived in this neighborhood, we could not sell to African-American families. So those covenants were strictly enforced, and it was almost like you had to sign a contract if you purchase house within an area that had covenants. Some of the people who signed off on it, their streets now named after the Lockridge Victor. It made me think, uh, these folks are crazy, you know? That is exactly what they felt in their heart, that they would write it down and sign a covenant. And when I think of covenants, I think of it uh, on the spiritual end, you know, something that you truly in your heart, mind, and soul agree to, which would not, in my wildest mind, be to bar black folks from living in a home that you used to own or you help build. Land of Opportunity, coming Thursday at 7.30 to KCPT. Madam, we're ready for you. Okay. Now, I've heard a lot of conversation going on here, but not one person has talked about the realistic of the situation of Kansas City, Missouri. We have not gotten our tax bills in control here of people who own houses. So how are we as landlords are able to modernize, make affordable housing when our taxes are about to go up on our property? So if my taxes go up two or $300, that means I cannot do affordable housing. But that is a major, that, that major, is a major issue. issue. 
Well, let me tell you, that is what we heard about from our uh, viewers too. Stacey Johnson Cosby, you're on the board of equalization. Yeah. Some landlords claim they would quit the business because they couldn't pass on tax increases to tenants. Is that happening? Well, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm not just worried about the landlords or the housing providers who get those bills because many of them have mortgages on those homes. Some people who are used to paying maybe $500 a year for their taxes are getting bills that are $1,000 and $1,500. How are they going to pay it? They cannot. And I'm talking about people who live in those homes. This may be the only home they have and where all of their family wealth and legacy is tied up. They're going to be in a lot of trouble. Tara, are you worried, though, about what this will mean for renters because landlords will just put that fee on them and charge more in rent? We are worried, and I want to tell you a story because we had property owners come to us actually months ago before this whole Bill of Rights debacle, right? Property owners who came to us and asked us, Casey Tenants, will you have our backs? and write a letter to the Board of Equalization that says that this assessment was botched. We voted to write that letter, and we wrote that letter. We sent it to the Board of Equalization. There's a lot of agreement. We don't think that the county's assessment was a fair process. There's lots of other components to this whole thing. Greg wants to know, what about Missouri Governor Mike Parsons' promise push to restore low-income housing tax credits, which were snuffed out by his predecessor, Eric Greitens? What difference does that really make Quinton Lucas? I, I mean, it's a shame the, the person who asked the question is gone because it speaks to the creation issue. How do we create more units? Through the low income housing tax credit, we have seen a great amount of creation for uh, rental units of, of different types, right, throughout our city, throughout our region. And so, frankly, I strongly encourage the governor to bring back that program. The state legislature took steps to it before. That continues to be a core part of Kansas City's uh, policy in Jefferson City. Sam, and, and, and I'm going to support that comment because if you look at uh, the renovation, the revitalization of the core the down, closer to downtown over the last 20 years, if not, very little of what you see there now, particularly with regard to the housing conversions, would have been possible but for that housing tax credit. Sam wants to know, what, is the, what about the biggest new tool being touted as the salvation of struggling neighborhoods? Opportunity zones in exchange for investing in challenging areas, Investors can cut or even eliminate completely their capital gains taxes, thanks to Uncle Sam, by putting their money in those areas that haven't been invested in. Does that do anything, in your judgment, to expand the supply of low-income and affordable housing in Kansas City? Stacey? I think it can, but we need to educate um, investors of what it is and what the possibilities are. It's yet another tool, another resource that I can use my private dollars on my own without depending on government dollars um, that I can um, be incentivized to create more housing in areas where it's needed. So we need to make, make sure other investors are aware that that's a tool where you can get financing for the project that you want to do. And neighborhoods would still have the opportunity to weigh in. Many neighborhoods thought that they'd be closed out of that process. Through our normal planning and development process, they would still have the opportunity to weigh in to either support the project or not. But why not work together to get housing in your neighborhood, working with the developer side by side, Tara, are you as enthused and excited? I'm not. For those in the audience who don't know what the Opportunity Zones program is, it's a Trump administration program that basically provides tax shelters for out-of-state investors to do their business. Um, and uh, there's a great report that I just want to shout out. An organization called SAGE, based in California, just did a report on the details of how the program functions and found that most of the time the program is going to function in a way that disincentivizes the investor from actually investing in what the community needs because they need to make a profit on their investment. And actually, I think it'll lead to a lot of displacement from our communities. And Rashida Tlaib is introducing a bill to repeal Opportunity Zones on Friday. What is your view on that? Are, are people approaching you already about this, Mayor Lucas? Yeah, people are always approaching us about opportunity zones. I, I, I take both points. I think they can be a positive opportunity for the city. I think we do need to, from the city side of things, try to stimulate investment in areas that we actually are wanting it in. So, to uh, Tara's point, we don't want to just say to random builder in inner city neighborhood, let's just build some sort of, say, check cashing institution. That's just a, a theoretical. Instead, what we want to actually make sure we're doing is saying, what's the development? we need, how can it be stimulated through this, and we should have a role within it. Still confused about opportunity zones? Never even heard the phrase before. Well, you're going to be hearing a whole lot about them in this new year. If you're scratching your head, we've taken all the hard work out of it for you. 
Fasten your seatbelt. This is Opportunity Zones 101. Madam, you'll be very patient. We're ready for your question. Awesome. Hi, um, Stacy. So first, I want to point out that you said us in the yellow shirts, if we wanted a piece of the American pie, we would be welcome to it. I'm guessing we're talking about home buying. Well, my American pie is actually a degree. I will probably always be a renter, and I'm perfectly happy with that. But with my question, yeah, I'm just letting you know there are other ones, and that's just not mine. I understand so, that. So um, it is clear that Kansas City housing policy is not currently representative of Kansas Cityans. Historically, renters do not have the same access to decision makers as landlord landlords and property owners, and it shows. How do you believe housing policy should be created? And that's for everyone. Stacy. With, with both, Thank you. both sides, we need the, the housing providers and the tenants together sitting down with policymakers. And I'd like to make a, just a quick correction on opportunity zones. That's something that Cory Booker and Tim Scott introduced under the Obama administration. It was signed into law during the Trump administration. So that's something that had bipartisan support. Is there an office within the Kansas City government where tenants can reach out about discrimination or landlord abuse? Yes. The Human Relations Department Civil Rights Division. Division. So if you have a complaint, if you've been discriminated against, I strongly encourage you to reach them. You can do that today. You don't need an office of, of tenant advocate. That exists already. And if you have any issues with their health department and the property you live in, you go to the health department. I would ask Stacy to go to those departments and find out how long the waiting lists are. Okay, well, what was, the, what was your experience then? What is the way? Um, I actually had healthy homes come to my home and say that it was uninhabitable. But then what do I do after that? They did nothing else. This person was allowed to sell that home without disclosing what was wrong with it. Right? They get away with all kinds of things, right? Okay, Stacey, if, 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 as a real estate agent, if they tried to sell the home without disclosing that, they're violating the law. They but did they're... sell the home. I spoke to the new owners. I understand, but they had to disclose any defects with the property. No, if not, they then they not. set themselves up for a lawsuit. We're ready for you. I want to direct this question specifically to you, Sam. In a meeting approximately three to four weeks ago, you categorized the east side of Kansas City as Baghdad and when we began talking about investment. How do you then, how do we then expect you to be honest and to trust you in bringing real investment to these sites. So, let, let's, 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 so, so, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me do So, hey, wait, so, wait, let me start, let me start. I'll just say this, and I wasn't in the meeting with Badland. I've known Sam for probably five years, right? He has, we have different views sometimes. He's been a decent man to me to work with. So I, I'll, I'll say for him right now, I wasn't there for Badlands, and this isn't actually really relevant to our conversation. I recall alluding to Baghdad the day after were my words as alluding to the worst 
situations, and this, that we were talking about situations all over the country, not just Kansas. I did not, I did not refer to the East Side as Baghdad. Okay. I want to, I want right. to make sure that that's on the right Okay, asked and answered. Thank you, sir, for asking the question. More of your questions in just a moment on this KCPT housing special. But if you struggle with a housing issue right now, what do you do? I was in a car accident on September 25th, so I haven't paid November or December, and they're going to evict me, or at least they're threatening to evict me. In a week, there is no way that I'm gonna come up with, they say I owe $2,000. I don't want no eviction on my record, so hopefully that they can take that off. The Tenants' Bill of Rights does not go into effect until June. Stay with us right after the show as we present the five biggest tips to help protect you now. And at the bottom of the screen, here are some numbers you can call for free legal help, housing options, and trustworthy advice. Madam, we'll go to you and then I'm going to wrap up. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're ready for you. I've heard tenant a lot. I've heard landlord a lot. What I haven't heard is taxpayer. You said, Tara, that the mayor needs to fund but who funds the mayor is taxpayers. I am an owner occupant. I'm neither a landlord nor a tenant, but I am currently buried under other people's garbage on the east side, even though there's an ordinance against illegal dumping. And I currently have other issues that come from the city not enforcing ordinance. Why will this one be different? How do I know it will be enforced? Mayor Lucas, thank, thank you. you very much. You know, I, I think um, that, that's a very important point. I will actually take this hit. The human relations department that Stacy referenced before has a lot of stuff, and we don't have enough staff for enforcement. Neighborhoods, a lot of our code enforcement does not have sufficient staff for it. Frankly, a number of the other areas are in many ways grossly underfunded, grossly under-resourced, and grossly understaffed. And so what I believe the policy goal right now with this, and frankly should be with everything, and this is what our new council and mayor have been more about, is don't just pass things for the heck of it. Pass things where there is actually funding connected with it, there's adequate staffing to support it. So we're not just saying let's all let's ban all illegal dumping. What we're instead saying is let's actually make sure that there are staff who can go out there, catch offenders, and actually bring them to some level of prosecution and make sure there's consistent enforcement. And we're all in this together. Thank you, Tara Ragavia, Tiana Caldwell. Thank you to Mayor Quinton Lucas, uh, to Stacy Johnson Cosby, and and Sam Alpert. Thank you, and thank you to our sixth panelist, you right here at the Plaza Library in Kansas City and at home watching this. Thank you all very much and good night. Support for this program comes from the Kauffman Foundation, AARP Kansas City, and from the annual financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. My name is Gina Kiala. I'm an attorney with the Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom. And today we're gonna to talk about five things you can do to protect your rights as a tenant. Tip number one, get it in writing. If you go look at a place to rent and the landlord tells you, don't worry, this place is gonna be all fixed up by the time you move in, just make sure you get that in writing. Just grab a piece of paper, write down all of the things that the landlord should fix, have the landlord sign it, you sign it, also include the date that the repairs should be done by, and keep a copy for yourself. If the landlord is reluctant to sign that piece of paper, proceed with caution. If it were me, I wouldn't sign the lease and I wouldn't move in. Tip number two, once you move in to your home, make sure that you make requests for repairs in writing and keep a copy. You have a right to safe and livable housing. So in the winter, there should be heat. And in the summer, there should be ventilation. The plumbing should work, the electrical should work, and there shouldn't be infestations of rodents or bugs. So if your home doesn't pass the test, make a request for repairs in writing. You can send it by email and keep a copy of your sent email or send, it, send a letter by certified letter return receipt requested. And if the landlord fails to make those repairs in a reasonable amount of time, get legal help before the situation escalates. Tip number three, know what a landlord can do and can't do under the law. A landlord can't force you out of your house without a judgment from the court. So that means before a landlord can force you out, the landlord has to go to court, serve you with a lawsuit, win the case, and get a judgment from the court. 
And even then, only the sheriff can physically remove you and your belongings from the home. And that doesn't happen until 10 days or more after your landlord wins the case. So that means a landlord can't change the locks without a court order. The landlord can't disconnect your utilities without a court order. And your landlord can't take your belongings and throw them out without permission from the court. If this is happening to you, seek legal assistance. Tip number four, don't ignore eviction lawsuits. If you come home and you find an eviction lawsuit on your door or someone comes and hands a lawsuit to someone in your household, don't ignore it. You may be able to prevent a judgment from happening by negotiating with your landlord, catching up with the rent, or asserting a legal defense. But if you ignore the lawsuit, then you will lose the suit and a judgment for eviction will be issued against you. And having that on your record is not good. It may make it impossible for you to rent again in the future. So if you get sued, get legal assistance right away. Tip number five, get your deposit back. In Missouri, a landlord has 30 days to return your deposit to your last known address. So you wanna make sure that the landlord knows where to send that deposit, or you can have your mail forwarded to a new address. A landlord in Missouri has to follow two procedures before he or she can withhold your deposit. First of all, a landlord has to give you notice of walkthrough. Second of all, a landlord has to give you an accurate accounting explaining why all or part of your deposit was withheld. If a landlord fails to do either of these things, you may be entitled to double the amount that was wrongfully withheld back. So get legal assistance if you're having trouble getting your deposit back. The Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom provides free legal help to low-wage workers in the areas of landlord-tenant law, consumer law, and employment law. If you need help, call 816-278-1344. And if you have a housing issue and you're permanently unemployed or disabled, Contact Legal Aid at 816-474-6750.